Welcome, chat, to this Wednesday edition of Wisecrack Live. It is April 10th. Producer Henry here saying thank you for joining us. Be sure to lick that stem as you sit on in in the chat. Hope you're on a cozy break or uh, away from anything laborious and alienating. We're going to have a, have a fun kind of catch-up day. Mike will be with us in just a moment. Sig, we will try to compress this all into an email. Surely it can be done. Hey, Philip, how's Berlin out there? Welcome back, Beatmaster. Glad to see you. How's Denmark doing today? Or that evening day over here, I suppose. Welcome, welcome, Daniel. Hopefully you're watching on company time. What up, use case? button. Is this big YouTube against us again? Natasha, I would just like to remind you to use Wisecrack responsibly. Uh, yeah, the Bird of Hermes, you've been here the whole time, haven't you? Ah, uh, welcome back, Dr. Clanicus. I do not cultivate that that current of pop culture anymore. I'm very blind to what's going on in the world of stand-up. Having said that, being in Austin, I do know that, for instance, there's the comedy club, uh, I think it's Mothership, uh, and a scene for the Rogan Sphere here, but it's, I don't know, it seems pretty fragmented in of its own, so I haven't interacted with it much. Thank you. 
Oh yeah, we absolutely do not do politics. Ooh, April 10th. It's 4-10. That's officially uh, 10 days from 4-20. Um, you know, if you were to go look back on our archives for last year's stream that took place on April 20th, you would not be able to find it because uh, YouTube deleted it. YouTube decided that last year's April 20th stream violated some policies. It's a true story, everyone. So, you know, if you were there, you were there, you know? Uh, you'll remember. Kurt Kennedy says 410 is Baltimore Day. I love the city of Baltimore, so there you go. I, uh, I'm happy to celebrate Baltimore Day any day of, of the week or the year. Book of Daniels on a shoot recently updated says what's up and we say what's up to you. Sean Ring Dooms is posting some Nietzsche, you know, use those emotes if you got them. Um, I see back there, Axella says, what are we getting up to today? We're going to check out some videos, talk about some stuff, hang out. Hopefully everyone had a nice eclipse day. Uh, Henry, tell, tell us about it. Did you end up having some eclipse yeah i was right in the darkness of it all the lights came on during the day downtown austin lit up in a pretty cool looking way for it to be dark in the middle of the day like that and uh it was a bit cloudy but uh mm -hmm. that still looked cool yeah i mean we didn't have it in i mean people so anyone from like los angeles especially who's saying that they experienced it they're lying to you and it's stolen valor. It was a thing where if like you looked through the right glasses at the at a very specific angle, you saw a sliver, but that's not real. I but I was watching uh, the band uh, Vampire Weekend had a I guess did a concert uh Monday afternoon in Austin and they live streamed it. And I was watching the show and at one point, you know, the sky started to change a little bit and the band was like, "We're going to take a break so everyone can enjoy the eclipse." And then the cameras panned out and it was so crazy to watch you know, just on a stream, it, like it very quickly got incredibly dark and then it was wild to see it go away, but it looked incredible. Uh, like I didn't even, I didn't quite understand that it was going to turn your city basically dark. Yeah, I mean, and I got really like just the energy and the excitement because it was very cloudy on and off in the morning. So people were kind of scared they were going to get to see anything. But like just atmospherically, like it gets cooler, like you feel it in the air. There's still like yeah. there's still like that electricity to it. Like you understand why people, you know, get superstitious about things like that. Oh, that's that's amazing. I after seeing how intense it actually is, I, you know. In 20 years, when that happens again, if I'm still alive, I, I want to go see it someplace. Because right now I was thinking, like, oh, it would have been fun to go someplace and make a thing out of it. Sorry, guys, I think I had a sneeze. Sure. Wow. Well, hey, guys, it's Wisecrack Live on this April 10th. Uh, it's me, Michael, joined by producer Henry, as always. Like the stream if you want. It helps us do things when you like it. So please consider doing that. Um, Outright Tiny made it, so we know we can officially start because you're outright here. I think today we're gonna we haven't we haven't really like caught up on videos in a while. We, you know, Henry keeps a really good run of show document, and we just keep tossing videos in there that we don't get to. So we have a backlog. So figured that might be a fun thing to do today. There's almost like. God, it's almost too many options. Uh, we'll we'll hang for a bit before we really dive into it. I'll tell everyone that one thing that I'm so tempted by is a Jordan Peterson interview with Daniel Dennett. Let's just go for it. Uh, should we watch a little bit of it and just just see, guys? Should we just see? Um, here, I'm gonna try something. Um, real quick.
I'm doing some I'm doing some uh uh some testing on titles and descriptions this week on the stream, guys. Because we want to figure out how to hack this shit. You know, we want to figure out how to make the system like us. So let's let's watch this for a little bit. And you know, I'll say that if we I see someone bringing up Harris. We could. We could. We could. We could. Um, yeah, yeah, and as always, thanks for hanging out. Hopefully everyone's doing well. Let us know how you're doing. I feel like this is a very uh, annoying and millennial thing to say, but a lot of people have noted that this week, to put it in very scientific terms, that, like, the vibes feel off. Has anyone, has anyone said that? Has anyone heard that? Has anyone been saying that? I've been seeing people saying that it does feel like a week where the vibes are just off. What I was thinking this week, too, you know, it should be a thing that we get one week off every three months. You know, I think one full week off every three months would be way better. What's up, Savic Hazard? What's up, John? Uh, Mitza says that Daniel Dennett is a goddamn national treasure. Daniel Dennett's a really good philosopher. So here, well, I'll cue it up. Um, and of course, we'll have to, when we get it, fast forward, Jordan Peterson. So, Dr. Dennett... And in man, if things didn't need to be retooled from the uh, offer to the audience, a really have nothing to do with religion. Okay, so uh, Jordan Peterson, as we all know, is not one of my 14 dads. Uh, if he was one of my 14 dads, I would have a genetic surgery done to remove his contribution to my chromosomes. That's what I would do. Um, and, you know, we, we talk about him sometimes, not because we love him, but because he's a, a prominent public. And so, oh, no, Natasha says no. And someone said the vibes are off because I had a cold. We'll watch a little bit and just see if he says anything. Um, Hector says vibes have been off for a while. Or that could just be me feeling the entropy more. So let's let's watch a little bit of this and see if it gets anything interesting. I'll tell you why. Again, not we're not watching this one because I get off on Jordan Peterson. You know, it's not like a sexual fetish. It's not like Henry is messaging me and saying, like, Daddy Jordan back on the couch, me hungry or anything like that. Henry did message me that. I'd be concerned. Um, but Daniel Dennett is a really important, like, real philosopher. Daniel Dennett is not a hack. Um, Daniel Dennett is someone who's worked. At, and, you know, he doesn't work in, like, the areas that I'm a expert in. Uh, what is lot of his stuff, area of expertise? Um, penis no it's a philosophy of mind <laughs> consciousness I, I i'm still 12 sometimes i'm still just a i'm still just a 12 year old boy i mean what i think about daniel Dennett for he was sort of when there was like the whole new atheist thing when that first happened he was one of the most legitimate people associated with it um but yeah so he looks into philosophy and cognitive science does some like relatively interesting work looking at the relationship and in some ways the tensions between how we historically think about the mind and how we think about thought philosophically and how that lines up with biology and cognitive science. So, you know, there, there's a tension sometimes in philosophy. Ah, sorry. Because what happens is like people for a lot of years, uh, philosophers for thousands of years have been really into analyzing how thought works um, and doing it in a lot of ways that involve observing rational thought. You know, I think like Descartes, I think therefore I am very um, uh, common philosopher. I'll think about this sort of stuff. What's happened in, you know, the past hundred, maybe less years than that, because cognitive science has grown a lot recently. Philosophers are then starting to say like, but what happens when science or biology or cognitive science tells us something different has a different account of the function of thought so um that's a, a big thing he's worked on also someone who is a, a very big atheist thinks that evolution is how we understand morality um looks at religion as a natural phenomenon so someone like dennett dennett isn't you know, when, when we talk about the new atheist, it was like Dennett, Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, or whatever. 
Dennett is the, is the least obnoxious because Dennett in general, and, and this could not be the case, but as far as I know, he's never been like a Sam Harris, um, Richard Dawkins asshole type towards people that are religious. Instead, he wants to argue that religion is the natural outgrowth of evolutionary processes and like a process of human understanding and morality. So not not a bad philosopher by many considered to be a very good and serious philosopher. Um, yeah, someone in the comment are bringing this up. So let's see. Yeah, we'll watch a little bit of this. Yeah, David says he does hard problem of consciousness stuff. Yes. Um, so, you know, we'll check, we'll check some of this out and see if they get in anything. I mean, the interesting thing, of course, is that Dennett is someone that doesn't see a lot of philosophical value in a traditional theological account of religion. We know that Jordan Peterson is currently on his Catholicism wave in which he is sort of combating a more secularist, secularist, materialist account of philosophy with the theological way of viewing things. So I don't know, let's see what they get into. But let's also talk about his whole intro pass, pa package, like frames him as some deep, like intellectual classical music guy. He's not. I want to make an intro for this stream that's like that, where it's like me and I'm in different poses and serious outfits, and there's sort of like modernist art cascading over me. What if it's like grateful? Hello, that everybody. Art? That would be sick. If it was just me and I was spinning and there was like a mandala, or was is, is mandala the, the things that I'm thinking of? I'm honestly not sure what, what you're thinking of there. Maybe I'm thinking of Nelson Mandela. Buddy, I had the opportunity today to talk to. He's really into this jacket. To the philosopher Daniel Dennett, who along with Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins is probably perhaps best known to the world as one of the four horsemen of the an atheist movement that was being so influential over the last 20 years. And as many of you know, I've had many discussions with Sam Harris and a couple of discussions with Richard Dawkins, another one hypothetically forthcoming. And it occurred to me a couple of weeks ago that I hadn't spoken with Dr. Daniel Dennett. And I felt that that would be enlightening and necessary. And so today we talked about his understanding of the relationship between science and morality, the relationship between morality and the secular, and the relationship between morality, secular, the secular and the religious. And like, this is one of those things too, where if I had no idea who Jordan Peterson was, and I just started watching this, I would be like, this sounds really interesting. We ex I would still think his jagged was not changed our views about how those different systems of apprehension and conception might be interrelated and um, talked about the difficulties in both discussing and reconciling the scientific and religious views. Um, Dr. Dennett's viewpoint is that the religious viewpoint has been superseded fundamentally, that it might have been a necessary precondition for civilized development, but that it's been superseded. And we got a long ways in that discussion, uh, not to the end and for obvious reasons, but um, welcome to the exchange. Thank you, Jordan. So Dr. Dennett, and I, and I will call you Dan, um, I'm very interested in talking to you about your ideas about religious belief and practice. And uh, you may know uh, that I've talked to some of the people who you've been intellectually associated with. I've had two discussions with Richard Dawkins, and I think we're planning a third. Richard Dawkins is such a twat. If, if the information I'm getting is correct, and I've spoken with Sam Harris. Oh, man. I mean, Daniel Dennett's like really old, so I don't, I don't say this to make fun, but he, he looks every, every year of his age right now. Like, the bandage on the head thing is intense. Harris a number of times, and... I think yeah, good. we we share a lot of interests, you and I, and one of them is a very deep interest, I would say. And I was reviewing your book today, um, Breaking the Spell. Whenever someone says I was reviewing your book today, it's like you were looking at the table of contents. And that's really the domain that I wanted to discuss, although I'm perfectly happy to branch out from that in, in anywhere that our conversation takes us. And I want to try out some ideas on you. Um, 
and I want to see what what you have to say about them. I'm going to start with a definition, if you don't mind, about from from your book, so that we have some sense that we're talking about the same thing. I think I'll try two definitions because there's two domains I think that we could dig into that would be very useful. So, I wonder sometimes as well if, and, and maybe this will change, but like if. It's almost like Jordan Peterson is really good at code switching and that I think he's aware he's talking to an academic who's who's like smarter than him, or at least is more knowledgeable in a specific area of philosophy, cognitive science, religion than he is. So his affect is totally different. It's it's more like the affect of a normal person. Um, yeah, I'm thinking back to the Destiny conversation when he straight up calls Destiny stupid for believing that like people can be like systemic victims and how like yeah like none of that tone is here yeah you know that there's no universe where he would ever yeah speak like that to someone like daniel dennett um because daniel dennett will will fuck him up like you because like daniel has that bandage but you should see the other guy you i'm interested in what i believe i'm interested in the the scientific analysis of religious belief i don't think that well i am too yes 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 we yeah and so so that's where i'd like to it, that's what I'd like to investigate. So I'm going to start out with a couple of definitions from your, from your books, and then we can dig into that. So the, the first one is that you described religious, the religious domain as avowed belief in a supernatural agent or agents whose approval is to be sought. What was it defined religions as social systems? I feel like that's not the best. Okay, I hope that I'm going to say this now because I'm going to put myself into a dangerous position because I think I'm going to disagree with Dennett. Go ahead. I have some issues too. Yeah, I wonder if I'm going to inadvertently end up agreeing with Peterson, which would suck. But yeah, I propose to find a religion as a social system whose participants vow belief in a supernatural agent or agency's approval is to be sought. I do think that's a really reductive, very like cursory glance at the Old Testament view of religion and and, you know actually we talk about this in the video we did on jordan peterson's read of religion and in that video after watching a bunch of peterson on religion we critique the idea uh that religion is just this hierarchical relationship of the individual seeking the approval of the divine there's actually a, a hierarchical element to it i think if you look at religion both from an anthropological a theological and a philosophical, fuck it, why not a sociological perspective as well? It has a lot more to do with like using mythology and narrative to understand the world and the formation of one's sub- subjectivity and then using those narratives to provide, I guess, a sort of grounding in social and moral reality. I think especially when you read, uh, and, and this is gonna be non-comprehensive because I'm not an expert on all of the religions, But, you know, at least if you look at elements of the Old Testament, definitely the New Testament, definitely elements of the Quran, there's so much in there about how we live, less about how we appease the divine. But, you know, like love your neighbor as yourself, to me at least, has a lot more to do with embodying religious principles to facilitate a social and moral ethic than it does um the appeasing of angry god and sky what what do you think henry yeah i feel this definition lacks to me something i find religion appeals to which is like an emotional satiation for answers that uh might be unknown by any kind of like logical or material means but people want like an emotional comfort or emotional reassurance uh when it comes to like what's making them happy or what turns them on or makes them motivated uh I, because I, I think sometimes uh, the approval uh, mechanism doesn't work, and you know people do the kind of the mystic individualist kind of religious pursuit stuff in ways that are more about like uh, finding what they perceive to be answers to abstract things they can't just like math out. And yeah, and this is a, a really good point, Henry. And I think looking at this definition too can help us think about and something we talked about before. We talked about this with Lux last week. The way in which, you know, in any type of like critical thinking, whether it be philosophy, religion, any type of humanities thinking, our first principles determine our analysis. So it's clear, right, if Dennett, what the fuck is that? Oh, sorry. If Dennett is defining religion like this, 
well, then that's going to dictate his analysis. So if we define religion in that way, it sets up a certain type of critique that maybe wouldn't work if we defined it in a more broad way. But let's see where they go from here. And I'm very curious to see if Henry and I inadvertently just became team JP. Please like the stream if you're here. Uh, and and you know, let us know in the chat what you think about that definition of religion. Whenever John's in the chat and calls me spicy, Mike, I feel this pressure. Um, like I need to, you know, turn up the spice. I feel like recently I've been so spicy that I want to be a little less spicy, but we'll see. Maybe John will push me over the edge. Thought. You that was a definition that I took from from breaking the spell. I'm wondering Oh, he had his book out and we caught him looking at his little yellow phone. If and then I'm going to add something to that, and then I'll get you to comment about whether you think those definitions still suffice or maybe how they've changed in your thinking or anything you'd like to add to them. So the, the other thing that I'm curious about here is you talked about aboutness, and you said the aboutness of a pencil, of the pencil marks. The aboutness of the pencil marks composing a shopping list is derived from the intentions of the person whose list it is. And I'm interested in that, the relationship between intentionality. And the reason I want to bring that into the discussion of religion is because I think there's a link between the ideas that I've been developing and the ideas of intentionality that, that at least in part typify your thought. And I don't see the relationship precisely between those ideas of intentionality and this definition of, relig of the religious enterprise that you just... I hope... I forget his name. Is it Jay or something? Someone who's been popping in a lot recently and has not liked the way we talk about Jordan Peterson. I hope he's watching or, or I think your name's Jay. I hope you catch this later because I feel like we're taking him pretty seriously here and not being very aggressive. I think you might like this. Described. And so that's the first. Well, we might turn on him in a second. First thing I'd like to get clarified. So, so my understanding of perception is that aim defines perception. Aim defines perception. Okay. And that seems to me to be akin to your, to, it's akin in some ways to your conception of intentionality and aboutness. Does that seem at least vaguely plausible? Yes, more or less. Um, when I speak about intentionality, I mean it in the philosopher's sense derived from Brentano. It's the about, aboutness is a good synonym for intentionality. You talking about Brentano there. I feel like someone asked this recently, maybe it was on... I think it was on Patreon or Discord. Shouts to our Patreon community. We love you. Thanks for being there. Um, if anyone has ever heard about phenomenology before, school philosophy, often associated with people like Husserl, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, it's a way of thinking in terms of our perception of phenomenon. And when we talk about attention and aboutness and all that sort of stuff, it's this notion that our perception is based on what we are aiming for what we are looking for in reality. Um, you know, Heidegger talks about this a little bit when he talks about how we use objects um, and how we use objects as technologies for the extension of our consciousness and things of that nature. I'm actually going to talk about this. I swear to God, this isn't a plug, guys. But um, on the next edition of Philosophy Office Hours coming this week uh, over on Patreon, I'm going to be talking about some of the stuff necessarily have anything to do with one's intentions. <laughs> if, if I'm startled by a loud noise, <laughs> my startle is about that loud noise, but there's no intention involved in the uh, sense of what do you intend, sir? Yeah, so it seems like what the, the distinction he's drawing is Peterson is asking and when he says intention, does he mean I want to do X thing and my desire to do X thing affects my perception? Dennett is saying that my perception is affected or the perception is less about my conscious intention and more about my experience of reality and in reacting to that. I have some intentions immediately, like I am going to run or I'm going to duck. I'm but, not uh, running anywhere. Uh, intention in the, in the, like the legal sense of, did you do that on purpose is, is a distinct notion. Okay, so can maybe you can clarify what it means, that means in relationship to aboutness. I'm going to criticize Peterson for something. I just think the phone is a bad look. You have a notepad in front of you. 
you know, yeah, right it's, down. It's the, the presence of the phone with the notebook that's getting me one or the other, man. Come on. It's taking me out of it. You know, it's just it's just taking me out of it. Then are those uh, uh, that's obviously I'm not familiar with the distinction that you're drawing or sufficiently familiar. What's the relationship between the concepts of intention and aboutness? Well, the Latin intendere arcum in is to point an arrow at. And Brentano and others uh, said, this is the key to thought. It's, it's directed at something. It has an intentional object. The intentional object is whatever the thought is about. And the curious thing about thoughts is that they can be about Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. If anyone's interested, and I've recommended this book before, there's a book called, I think it's by Sarah Bakewell, and it's called At the Existentialist Cafe or something like that. And it's this account of people like Sartre and Merleau-Ponty, um, you know, Simone de Beauvoir, people in that little circle. And the way that they described phenomenology in early description was like, you can do philosophy about an apricot cocktail, apricot cocktail. And I think I said apricot and not apricot because then I said cocktail. But I want to note that, that I don't think that was a Freudian slip towards, you know, phallic desire. I think that it was just the word cocktail was coming directly afterwards. But you guys can analyze that. If there's any psychoanalysts in the chat, let me know if I said apricot because of a unconscious desire for phallus or if that was simply just a, a tired person confusing two words he was going to say together. But the gist there about the apricot cocktail is that phenomenologically we could do philosophy about anything because we look at an object and we we almost ask ourselves like how does the object present itself to us how does our consciousness apprehend and understand this thing and what does it mean when we take the thing on its own terms the idea there being that in other ways of doing philosophical analysis we're not letting the thing speak for itself we're not letting the object have a life of its own. We are instead projecting categories onto it, kind of in like a Kantian way. So I don't know, just some background for some of the stuff that might be interesting. I need everyone to know that we're, we're using a thing called Watch Together to Watch Videos. I don't know if Henry's getting this now too, but I'm the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews wants to give me a free flag pin that says stand for Israel. I'm getting none of that. What? Where are you Why? on the internet right now? <laughs> In that case, they're about something that doesn't exist. But um, that creates logical Sorry, problems. But we can set those logical problems aside and just deal with the fact that we have to explain how information that's in our brains can be about things in the world, and also about things that don't even exist. Okay, so that, okay, okay, so that 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 helps. And and the the Latin that you referred to. Oh, the Latin. Did you like the Latin, Jordan? Um, but I think in terms of religion, then what Dennett is saying is that we're able to think about things, both objects and ideas, whether they exist or not. So of course we can think about our apra hot cocktail. Um. We'd also think about, like you said, Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or a 15th father who actually loved us. Um, and I, I bet he's going to use that to talk about religion, right? Because we can we can think about things that don't exist. Uh, let's every time I, I apologize for digressing philosophically, you all tell me to shut the F up and just do it. So David Hume, fun guy. Uh, David Hume had a fun read on religion. He was an, an empiricist philosopher. So his old deal is like, I only want to talk about shit uh, that I can experience. That's what matters to me. And, you know, someone might say to Hume, well, we talk about God, and I've had no experience of God, so QED, God exists. And Hume, Scottish drunkard, who once got so drunk he fell in a river, true story, um, was like, nah, when you talk about God, you're really just talking about a collection of ideas that you bundle together in your head. So maybe you think about a father figure and you think about wisdom and you think about justice and you think about someone who's mad at you and you think about a loving caretaker, all these sorts of things. And you bundle those ideas together in your head and you're like, oh, God, God must exist. But we could, of course, say like, 
we can imagine a racist whale that played guitar in a Limp Bizkit cover band. And we could talk about the racist whale that plays guitar in a Limp Bizkit cover band while, while fully knowing that a racist whale that plays guitar in a Limp Bizkit cover band doesn't exist. But we can think about that because we know about whales, racism, Limp Bizkit, guitars, and cover bands. Uh, if anyone's an artist, well, I know there's some artists here. If you want to draw a picture of the racist whale that plays guitar in a Limp Bizkit cover band, feel free. But draw it in such a way where the racism is like subtly implied so we could actually use it. Um, but there's, there's your lesson. It was also fair. I'm going to throw something in from left field, let's say. So the word sin, the word sin, um, there, there's, there's a, a three language, there's three language point of derivation for the word sin. They're all from archery. To sin means to miss the target. So Greek, hum, Greek is hamartia. I don't remember what the Hebrew is. Chet, I think, but I can't remember. It doesn't matter. It means to miss. So it matters, but it also doesn't matter. I do feel a little bit like Dennett was like casually dropping Latin, but you see how when he like dropped the Latin, Dennett was just kind of like chill with it. And then JP has to be like, I know three languages. The target. And it is an archery term. And so it's, you could, you could think of, you could think of sin in that regard as malintention or misintention. I also, I'm so cu I'm curious how he threads this needle of bringing up sin. or merely failure to miss the target, and so, so there's a there's a and and then you talked about intentionality with. Oh, if you do have the whale image, you can go to wisecracklive six 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 at gmail dot com. Wisecracklive six 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 at gmail dot com. I'll check the email today during the stream as well. So check that out. If you're just tuning in, it's Wisecrack Live. We're gonna catch up on some videos today. We're watching a. Uh, Interview with Daniel Dennett and Jordan Peterson. Daniel Dennett, philosopher, cognitive science guy, actual certified smart person. Jordan Peterson, he's a jacketman. He's our favorite jacketman who wears elaborate jackets that I think it says toy on his shoulder. With regard to thought being directed at something. And so the, the way I've been conceptualizing the religious enterprise isn't so much in relationship to the definition that you offered with regard to avowed belief in a supernatural agent or agents whose approval is to be sought, although I'd like to get into that because it's dead relevant. Let me run something by you. I'll say thus far, everything Daniel Dennett said has been much more clear than what Peterson said. So when we aim our attention at something, we're aiming our attention within a hierarchy of aim. See, but what he's doing here, just note the difference. Dennett was talking about how, according to Brentano and, and, and a school that's more associated with early phenomenology, um, it's not about projecting our intention onto reality. It's about paying attention to thoughts and the way in which we can think about anything. Um, and we could sort of treat objects as things in and of themselves. But then Peterson is saying, whenever we aim an intention, and Dan Dennett already said, I'm not talking about an intention that way. I say, whenever we do that, we project a hierarchy, which is, again, talking about a more transcendental form of thinking. Think about your friend, Immanuel Kant. Fun story, once I was talking about Kant in a class and I was in front of the room, it was like, you know, a bunch of tired 19 year olds. And I was like, the thing with Kant is with Kant and blah, blah, blah. And I see this young woman in the back of the class. And every time I say Kant, she's going. And I, and I see her doing that. So I stopped for a second and she puts her hand up and I was like, yeah. And she was like, what word are you saying? And I was like, Kant, K-A-N-T. And she went, oh, you know what she would, you know what she was really thinking. All I'd say is Kant, K-A-N-T, um, sort of a, a, a transcendental philosopher has this idea that we have like patterns of thought, like nets, let's say nets of understanding, and we throw those structures onto reality and they help us understand things. Dennett and, and phenomenology are doing something different, and it seems like there's a little confusion going on here. And the religious enterprise looks to me to be the enterprise that specifies the highest aim or the most foundational Cash aims. Cash gets it. And I think that our, our instinct that there's such a thing as depth, say depth in literary analysis, for example, or depth JJ. in significance yes. in relationship to concepts, is a function of the fact that there's a hierarchy of, of intention. And I think that as you move toward the foundation or up to the apex, depending on which metaphoric frame you use, 
you start to enter into the realm of what's deep and that the realm of what's deep is what signifies the religious. I just, I find him really hard to understand sometimes. And I know that it's, you know, I'm tired. I'm not gunning all cylinders, but I, I didn't find it super hard to understand what Daniel Dennett was getting at. But it seems again, like, I, I guess my summary of what Peterson just said is that Whenever we do or think a thing, that thing has some sort of teleological aim, um, which, and there's a Hebrew word for that, which he forgets, but it doesn't matter. That aim is always relative to a hierarchy of value, and the deeper the value on that hierarchical scale is the, is, is the religious. So the religious signifies some sort of ultimate depth of value. I mean, it's interesting because you just do, it sounds a little bit like a religious Platonism. So for those of you who know about Plato, um, P-L-A-T-O, you know, very down and dirty version of things here. But Plato shit was that we get caught in our day-to-day -day life thinking that reflections and shadows and things that aren't real, basically like ideological crap and things we see in the media. I mean, he didn't have the media back then that we take things to be true that are not true. So what it means to learn to think critically and philosophically is to see past like the smoke and mirrors and the BS and to use critical thinking and mathematical reasoning to arrive at a higher way of thinking, like the form of the thing. This is why in the allegory of the cave, little dude comes out and he sees the sun and the sun represents this highest value, of course, uh, post-Christ, Christian thinkers, people like Augustine, take Platonism and kind of like merge it with Christianity. They shove some communion wafers off its butt, and there you go. Um, and it kind of feels like that's what he's doing. And if that's what he's doing, it's not like wrong or bad or dumb. It's just not interesting because there's already a, like there's already a, a school of thought that does this, and it feels like he's trying to invent something new. A thing I hate with people who act smart is when they <laughs> rephrase things that are like known ideas as if it's like an idea they had it's sort of like if you're with a friend who's stoned and he's like guys there is modernism was a thing but like what if something what if there's something that comes after it what if it's like it's like po it's like post it's like post modern and you're just like dude that's already a thing you skipped literature class for the past three weeks we already learned this i mean this is like a technical definition and so imagine that your intentions Peter, Any he, given he intention in depends jacket. on another intention, and that depends on another intention. But as you stack the intentions up and analyze them, you go down into the depths to see what the foundational intentions are. The, the religious is the realm of the foundations awesome, like of intention. Religion is the realm of the foundations of intention. There's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah, religion is the realm of the foundations of intention. So religion, I guess, is a set of irrational first principles that motivates our action i mean i can understand like religion as the realm where we place uh ideas we consider like paramount to like our being but like yeah i don't know if that's necessarily like in like i don't know if we intentionally get there sometimes i think a lot of people uh accidentally stumble into like a sort of spirituality they make of their own experiences but i'm not sure if intentions like a considered part of that yeah, I mean, and in general, too, like, I'm one that that doesn't have a hard time with the idea that we can have religious and pseudo-religious first principles that aren't, like, objects of, of reason, things that we feel are intuit. But then the issue is, like, we start, let's say, with that religious first principle. We use it to motivate our action, but maybe our actions circle back and let us know that that thing is true or wasn't true. It's sort of retroactive reasoning. Dialectics, baby, it's what it's all about. Um, but I don't know how that point is conflicting Dennett's thinking about this stuff. So let's see what Dennett says in response. So that's a different definition, obviously, than the supernatural agent definition. And so I'm wondering, well, first of all, if that explanation makes any sense to you, because it's pretty brief, and Was also brief? what your reactions to that are. Well, my reaction to it is that the term that I would use for what you're talking about is the sumum bonum, the highest good. And that is a, 
Now, I just want to note this, too. When he says the student bone and the highest good, like, Dennett's basically saying, yeah, there's a thing called the highest good that we have throughout the entire history of philosophy going uh, from the Greeks into the medieval era and then sort of transitioning its meaning but still having a function when we talk about the absolute in the era of idealism. Um, like, the highest good is, like, a thing. It is a is a foundational concept, you know? Um, it's like when you talk about you know, there's like Anselm's uh, proof of the existence of God, that of which nothing greater can be conceived. I think I got that right. I haven't read or taught ancient philosophy of religion in many, many years. But, and I like the way Dennett's dropping this, but he's kind of just like, yeah, it's just like a thing. That's a thing that you would learn if you took like a 201, you know, medieval philosophy or philosophy of religion class. Not necessarily a religious idea. I have my sense of what's the most important thing. What are the most important things? And I'm not religious, but I'm, I'd like to say, deep. I, I share the hierarchy of ends that you describe. I don't think of my endorsement and allegiance to that ethic as a religious ethic, but there it is, and I am happy to say there are some things that are more important than others. Okay, okay. Well, well, that that's... Yeah, I think it, in a sense, I think what Dennis just did there is take something and make it a lot more simple. Just being like, yeah, like, this is just a thing. We all have um, first principles. We all have ideas that we think are foundational and more important than others. But that in itself doesn't indicate the necessity or the absolute existence of the religious, at least in the way that Peterson's thinking about it. I mean, this is where my dog, Soren Kierkegaard, has a great thing in one of the books. And some of you, a few people have sent me this recently, so shouts to you. Um, I talked about a book over on Philosophy Office Hours on Patreon, Kierkegaard's Present Age, and a couple of people sent pictures of them having the book. Some of them did on Discord. I think that's rad. Get books, steal books, buy books, download books, however you get the books, you get the fucking book. But in that, Kierkegaard kind of does this thing where he's like, yeah, religion, God, but like, people might make their science their God, their love, their money, um, their art, whatever we believe in as this foundational primary good becomes for us a religious value, which is not a hyper original thing to say. And it's not something that necessitates the, I guess, like primary existence of a theological conception of religion at the heart of all humanity or thinking. And I almost think the annoying thing here is that what Peterson's doing is kind of setting up this dichotomy where it's like, Either you have theological thinking at the heart of everything you do, or you're a bloody nihilist postmodernist or whatever, right? And then we just, but we, it doesn't have to be that way. Why is our culture so obsessed with all these dichotomies? One can acknowledge that there are foundational truths at the heart of one's thinking and acknowledge that those could be religious in a classically theological sense, or they could be religious in so much as they describe someone's foundational motivating principles but those things don't have to be like mutually exclusive in a way that sets up a weird you know manufactured intellectual culture war right but it does feel like what peterson's interested in is trying to like shoehorn philosophy into his his culture war thing or something like that um Pro Protagon says the way Michael talks about Kierkegaard being his dog is pretty funny. If I get a dog, I'll name it Soren. So, um, it can be that phone GB. Does you see how happy Michael is talking about this stuff? You know, what I think the thing is like, I used to talk about philosophy like every day and think about it all the time. And more and more recently with work, I've had less time to do that. So it is fun to do this with you all and i appreciate you all creating that space yeah peter uh fager says isn't the highest good something people have been arguing about forever like everyone has the concept yeah um just just yes 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 uh you know we can move on in a little bit too but this is i don't mind watching this because it's not i feel like we're not uh 
what's the word I'm looking for? We're not necessarily hate watching. I feel like, oh, yeah. what do you think? I feel like we're think actually you're... using this to talk about some ideas and we're not just like pausing to be like, fuck these guys. I think it's springboarding you into ideas you're legitimately passionate about. I'm enjoying just letting you kind of speak about this with the chat because yeah, you're not like cynic watching or hate watching it. Uh, you're kind no. of curious and yeah, guys, we're curious. Um, Grace said cats are Kierkegaard coded and you're totally right. Kierkegaard would not be a dog. Most philosophers would be cats and not dogs. And that's actually why I wanted to start with definition, right? Because there's no sense having a discussion about what something means unless we can agree what territory we're wandering over. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so now we seem to have established, okay, so we seem to have established some agreement that there's a hierarchy of conceptualization, or you said even more specifically, a hierarchy of good, and you... I mean, I think too, this idea that one has to, and this would be, I think if we were having a conversation about natural science or even aspects of political theory agreeing on our definitions before we engage in a conversation or a debate might be important but philosophically speaking i think interrogating those definitions in itself is useful right the whole first part of plato's republic is socrates talking to some dudes with weird names um about what is justice and they just talk about what is justice is it this is it that well what if it's this well if it's this it means that and that in itself gets us somewhere. And I think Peterson's maybe missing the step of almost doing the work of why, why is he so obsessed with religion having that specific definition? What are the outcomes of religion having that definition? And what does it get him or what does it do for him? You referred to the summum bonum. And, and you said you have a hierarchy of good and you believe that there's something hypothetically something at the apex or at the foundation so okay yeah. so may, may, okay so let's see let's it's it's definitely the case that there are medieval conceptions of the judeo-christian god as the summum bonum and there are insistences in the biblical corpus that in the final analysis god is ineffable even though he's conceptualized in those stories as a spirit with it with whom communication is possible. I mean, I think the thing too is when he talks about Judeo-Christianity, which I know we don't say anymore. I forget the thing that we do say. I'm old and tired. But, you know, when he says that Judeo-Christianity has this conception, I think, and, and this isn't necessarily critique because maybe he's just implying this, but the reason you have that in medieval philosophy is because you have basically people taking christianity and running it through the filter of greek philosophy and using those philosophical structures to understand it but his nature disappears into the ineffable that's what that what the theologians claim when they're pushed and so Oops, okay so Sam, let's see if we can question. figure that out so i don't think that the conception of god as the sum of all that's good is an accurate conceptualization it seems to me it's more like whatever god is conceptualized to be is the is that which all good things share in common okay so defining god is that which all good things share in common but he's using what, what what peterson's doing right here is describing a kind of at least as i understand it a platonist conception of god because again plato is like there's a thing called the good g-o-o-d and all things that are true participate in the good it's almost like this idea that there's like a magical orb. This is a way I think about it. Um, and anything that has truth somehow participates in that orb, is like touched by that orb. The easiest way to do this, when I used to teach this, you know, I'd write like Plato's good on the board, and then you just go erase one of the O's in good, and it's like God. And it's like, this is reductive, but that's basically what happens in the medieval era. They take this idea of Plato's good is that which all things that are true share. We call it God instead, bada bing, bada boom, but structurally we're doing the same thing. Right. I, I don't think I said bada bing, bada boom when I was teaching though. That makes, that makes the concept of God something like the central element in a web of ideas that surround the concept. It's in a web. So God is Madame Web. Of the good is such. Right, right. It's not exactly a sum. And it's important to be precise. I would believe in God if God was Dakota Johnson. Tice when discussing things like this. Now, you said you have a, a conception of the highest good, and so can I ask you what God that is? God is neutrinos. 
Well, it's not readily definable, uh, but there's, there's, I think that human beings are the measure of what's good. And over the eons, we have gradually discovered and invented and contrived uh, standards of what we think good is. And that's as much for, you know, a good wheel or a good axe or a good airplane or a We need some good airplanes. They keep falling apart. Guys. Good person. I'm flying next week or in two weeks, and I'm really afraid. Uh, so one thing he's saying, well, I'll let him finish, but when, when he describes that, in case that sounds a little bit like bullshitty, I think what he's getting at, and, and this would vibe with someone like uh, the philosopher George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, someone I like a lot, who's also my dog. Hegel might be a dog. Um, it's basically saying that, like, the good or the highest good is developed continuously via the collective activity of human thought. So when he talks about like the wheel, at one point, the collective energy of human rationality had a version of the wheel that was the best wheel. But that particular wheel at that point, 200 years ago, isn't as good as the wheel you get now on a Tesla Cybertruck. This stream is brought to you by Tesla and Elon and the Cybertruck. I drove by one the other day and I just wanted to be like, come on, what, what, what are we doing? But uh, but as you know, things develop, the wheel gets better. Music develops, food develops, our ideas of, of justice and equality develop. Because of course, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, people who put a lot of thought into it, uh, who thought they were interested in justice were still like, yeah, I got slaves though. Um, but eventually via thinking we arrive at something better. So I, I think that's kind of what he's saying there. And there is, in my mind, a he's grounding it in consciousness and human thought, the idea that there isn't some magical realm where the wizard comes down and the wizard says, oh, this is what's true. Instead, we arrive there at intentional collective thought. Um, and I think what he's maybe saying or what he's getting at is that Peterson's wanting to like skip past that idea of the process of collective human thinking and use religion as a cheat code to just jump to the end. And I do think that's kind of, you know, it's what we see a lot these days. And we don't do politics on the show. As we all know, I have, I have 14 dads and not one of them has ever registered me to vote. Um, there was a really funny comment a few weeks ago that was like, it is insane that they keep talking about how they don't do politics and they've never voted. And then they talk about politics. Sorry for our wry humor, but. Oh, fuck, what I was about to say. Oh, but in our current like culture war, it does feel like sometimes people want to use and people do this on all sides. People might some people might use religion to be like, I don't have to think this is the idea. This is the thing. And other like really boring liberals might be like, I don't have to think the West Wing said this or or Lynn manuel Miranda performing a rap song at Hillary Clinton's daughter's corporate event said this. And that's true rather than engaging in, in careful collective thought arriving uh, at some sort of truth. So hopefully that elucidates what I think is going on here a little bit. And the, all sorts of different, the, you know, there's even, I suppose, good machine guns, good at being a machine gun. Uh, but shouts, shouts to Lockheed Martin, shout, shouts to the military industrial complex, shout, shouts to the biggest Raytheon military weapons acres. ever. Shouts to Raytheon, shouts to the U.S. government. Guys, we're USA, USA. We currently have one of the biggest weapons deals ever with a certain country. Um, but someone asked a really good question about whether it's utilitarian. I don't think what Dennett's saying is that the good is utilitarian, because what he didn't say is that we arrive at what is most useful. I think we arrive at a concept that is true and good. The example there, of course, would be like the people hundreds of years ago that were like, I'm smart, I read books, but I have slaves. In a sense, you could say that slavery for them was good in a utilitarian sense, but we would hope that in continuing to think critically about what it means to be human, they arrive at a, a higher concept than the utilitarian one. And I'm pretty sure that's what, what Dennett is getting at here. Um, I do know that Dennett, I think, has a little bit of utilitarian streak in his gray beard or his white beard. There's no streaks in that beard. It's just white. He is Santa. Um, but that that's my take on it. But again, I have not read I've not read the words of Daniel Dennett since 
Barack Hussein Obama was president. Speaking of Barack Hussein Obama, I don't watch SNL that much, guys, but the last episode, I don't know if you ever watch SNL, Henry. Um, Kristen Not Wiig hosted last weekend. Okay. Kristen Wiig hosted last weekend, and she brought back some SNL classic cast members to be in her sketches. And it was just like, oh, yeah, people can be funny. And it kind of made the current people look very bad. But there's one sketch where Will Forte plays a particular character who says, Joseph Hussein Biden. And I almost crapped my pants laughing. Um, you, need, you, need, you need to see it in context. And if NBC wouldn't strike down our stream, I would show you some of those sketches now, guys. But even if you think you hate SNL, especially when they had a Alon host, last week's episode had some really funny stuff. The moral good is a particular human realm. I think animals don't really have morality. They have something. Yeah, because animals don't have morality. Because I, you guys hear about these whales? Um, if you're just tuning in, there's these racist whales that play guitar and Limp could cover bands. It makes morality possible, but they don't have morality. But we human beings have evolved systems of morality. And... I just want to, speaking of humans doing amazing things, I do want to share some news with you guys. Um, Lionsgate and Hasbro have signed a deal with Margot Robbie's Lucky Chap to produce the Monopoly movie based on the legendary classic board game. Guys, they're going to make a Monopoly movie. And I'll say this, the only way to do that good would be to have, to like make a movie about the horrors of capitalism. Um, that's the Monopoly movie. I don't yeah. think they're going to do that. I did see someone... Um, Maybe it was our friend Logan Reese. I was scrolling Twitter. Um, maybe it was Logan. It was someone who said they should have Boots Riley direct it. Um, but wow, guys. Wow. This is where we're at. They could do something really smart with it. They really could. But wow. They implicitly fix. They don't define in the geometrical oh, sense yeah. See, Logan's what in the, the highest now, yeah. good is. But they... They outline it. They they point to it. Someone brought up Jumanji in the chat. Go watch the SNL sketch from last week about Jumanji. It also has one of the funniest lines I've ever seen. <clears throat> and and it's a moving target. Uh, what we what we think of as good today is quite different from what was thought good back in Old Testament days. Nobody today would want to live with Old Testament morality. Have you met America, Daniel? Have you have you met have you met her? Um, I agree with him. Again, it's like this makes me think of of Hegel because the way Hegel describes things is like there was this absolute, right? Everything was together, and there's this split, and you have subjectivity, like more or less us, and then the absolute or objectivity, and the journey of consciousness is us getting closer and closer and closer and closer to understanding the absolute. In Aristotle, we get this idea that what, what virtue is, is getting closer and closer and closer to understandings of virtue and justice. We, of course, never get all the way there. But I find this, and, and this is actually, I know that Dennett isn't this, but that's where this type of philosophy overlaps with existentialism, right? Because the whole point of an existentialist position is to say, it's never just that someone says, oh, this is the right idea. I believe the right idea, so I'm good now. It's that we are constantly striving to better appropriate and understand and embody truer ideas, but we're always circling back and interrogating that. I think this is why Jean-Paul Sartre is such a good example, because I've talked about this before. You know, you look at someone like Jean-Paul Sartre, um, and if he looks at you, it's weird because he has the one, the one lazy eye. But, but when you look at him, it's, it's, just, it's, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable because you don't know which eye is the one you look at, and you're not going to ask him. That'd be weird, but he does well for himself. He had an open marriage. He was doing fine. But Sartre is someone who, who changes his mind. You know, from, from his first big book to his next big book, he looks back and he's like, ooh, some of that isn't quite right, which makes me trust people when they're willing to, like, rethink ideas. And they do that because they're aware that, like, truths, at least in a philosophical sense, as we understand them, are not these fixed things. Even if we want to say there are fixed objective truths out there in whatever fucking, you know, eclipsey cosmos there is, we don't have ownership to those. We might just get a little bit closer to them. Uh, uh, we've, we've come a long way from that. 
Uh, thank goodness. <laughs> thank goodness. Oh, Sean's in the chat. What's up, dude? Evolved. The cost of living has already increased 17% this year. Guys, I just want to say something. Like, we do ads sometimes for things that you don't like and I don't like. But, like, my man is doing ads for the Birch Gold Group, the precious metal IRA specialist, to be clear. Birch? Not, not As in, like, John Birch Society? Dude, I don't know. It might be. I wish they were IRA specialists, like Irish Republican Army specialists, but they're not. Like, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. But just, I'll tell you this. If Birch Gold Group gets in touch with us to tell our audience that we got to, like, tell them about precious metal investment, I kind of want to watch this. <laughs> Let's watch it. To rise bit. despite interest rate controls. As our national debt skyrockets, you need to be confident in the financial service companies you work with, especially regarding. It was this horrible voiceover, too. This motherfucker recorded it on, like, his iPhone. Your money and future. Birch Gold is a proven industry leader that you want on your side. They'll show you how precious metal investment can afford. I don't think you should invest in precious metals, guys. I just don't think you should do that. For your lifestyle and retirement, even in turbulent economic times. Like, this is. Oh, man. I know there's an inherent irony in me critiquing the ad things here, but this is this is pretty extreme. Um, let's see if I, I'm afraid. Let's see, is it? Birch Gold understands that Nav. Let's see if I can skip ahead. It's hard with this one sometimes. So I'm afraid I'm going to go too far. Text Jordan. If someone wants to be insane right now and you don't care about getting spam on your phone, if you want to text Jordan to 989-898 and let us know what you get, That'd be really fun. Gold. You'll learn how to convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax sheltered IRA in gold. Do not convert your IRA or your 401k into a tax sheltered gold IRA. That's insane. The best part is it doesn't cost a penny out of pocket. Just text Jordan to 989898. That's Jordan to 989898 today. Guys, that's an ad that that's crazy. You don't want to give the John Birch Society your, your retirement savings? Like Here's the thing, guys. I know that you are all smart enough so that sometimes there's like an ad we have to do where you might just be like, I don't really fuck with that. And I know that you don't see me being like, I don't, I don't know. I just, that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah, someone says like, I like how the background is him like taking notes, you know? Also, I don't know why they need to do ads because it's for the Daily Wire and the Daily Wire is owned by that oil company. Someone pointed this out after the fact. You know, we talked about Jordan Peterson and and climate change um, or the lack thereof when we talked about the Jordan Peterson and the D E S T I N Y um, video. And I didn't realize this till after the fact. But you know, all this shit is produced by Daily Wire, and Daily Wire is owned by like a like an oil tycoon. So shocking that they would be a a little weird on climate change. Um, Edgar says it gives you a link to 24 pages of insider info on gold and silver. Um, Sean's going to tell us about a time chart. Rusty Poopar, I would invest in the IRA. I probably shouldn't say that. One of our most controversial, so our 420, I think our two most controversial streams. Well, one of them is the 420 stream that is no longer on the internet. The other, I think, was the stream that happened the morning that the queen died because Oh, that one I don't think is online either because I played. Violence. Yes, because I played IRA songs and I showed a video of "Come Out, Come Out, Ye Black and Tans," and the video was just B-roll of IRA tanks and shit. And that one got taken off, and that was like the funniest stream ever because I feel like a lot of people that day were like, "Oh shit, you guys are really going for it here, talking about the queen after she dies." This is getting a little intense, but they're kind of into it, and then other people were like, "This is insane." Someone is dead. And I was just like, you know what? I was reflecting on my ancestors um, over in Ireland. And I just think if my grandparents and my great-great-grandparents knew that the head of a state that directly led to famine and genocide in their homeland had died, and if they knew their future grandson living all over in America um, was celebrating that woman, they would come back as Irish potato ghost and kill me. And I'm not trying to get killed by a potato ghost. I, I'm not afraid of no ghost, but I'm afraid of an Irish grandparent potato ghost. Okay, so 
it was interesting, you know, when you, when you listed out things that could be good, the the things that came to mind first for you uh, were 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 some of them were Whoa, tool Ross. like a good wheel, a good Thank axe, you. even a good machine gun. And so I like that. I like friggin' much. Jordan Peterson likes the good machine gun. Um, sorry, I wasn't keeping up with the chat. Ross Peterson, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate that. It truly means a lot to us. So there you go. Really, 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 really appreciate that. John just said bussin' makes me feel good. I don't know what the context is of that. Um, hey, the fire sage. I'll talk to I'll talk to Destiny sometime. Honestly, I will. I'll, I'll hit him up at some point. I just kind of like didn't want to deal with all of the energy that week. I think once things chill out um fun gbt that makes me very sad to know that people in dublin are not treating each other better than how the brits treated them um adam hall uh notes that ghost with the most went to the irish pub the day the queen died yeah i went to a an establishment that night is real um wait there was a david graver and peter thiel debate i know that that's old garrett but it would still be fun to look at that yeah, it's how so fun old to look is that? At. I've been I've been diving more into Graver's work recently. Yeah, um, we'll look that up now. I get the bussin' thing. Now I get it. Um, okay, let's go back to it. I just want to thank you. That was a, a fucking sick super chat, Ross. So we really appreciate it. Appreciate all you. Oh, Al Allie's in the chat, and there's cats in boxes. So that's what I'm seeing right now. Uh, but hey, good to see everyone here. As always, thanks for hanging out. I haven't done station identification in a while, so you know this is Wisecrack Live. Uh, I'm Michael Burns. I'm here with producer Henry. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for watching the channel. You know, if, if you feel like you can do stuff to support us, you can, you can throw us some, some super chats. You can join the channel. Uh, you can always join our Patreon. Um, we got some good stuff going on the Patreon. We put up a podcast episode last week. Um, Amanda just recorded another research deep dive with our, our friend Corrigan Vaughn. Uh, you might know Corey from the Jack of All Graves podcast as well. So they do awesome stuff there. Um, let's see. And then we have another, um, philosophy office hours coming up. I'm gearing up to launch the new, like philosophy office hours, reading group class thing. And I know I've talked about his work a lot, but I kind of think I want to start on Byung Chil Han and maybe look at Byung Chil Han's burnout society book. So if anyone, I don't know, I'm probably going to do that. If anyone wants to grab that book and get out ahead of it, feel free. But I think we're going to, going to spend some time reading Byung Hill. Byung Hill Chan's uh, Burnout Society book. So let's watch a little bit more of this. And maybe we'll let's do a little more Peter Simmons. We'll shift to something a little vibier. But you know, let us let us know what you think, and let us know how this vibe is is sitting with you. Oh, so, man, we're only seventeen minutes in. I think that, and I think we have some commonality of conception there too, because there's a there's a pragmatic definition of good. It's something like something that's good fits its purpose, and. This mf or loves definition. Oh, that would be in a hierarchy as well. So that purpose would have to be good as well, right? There's there's a functional element to that. And so, okay, and so it, the, the way that I've been conceptualizing perception, and I think this is a neurophysiologically informed conceptualization, is that... I feel like, and I've done this before, whenever you're in an argument, debate, conversation, and you pre-justify the terms you're using, like... I mean, as I've read in a lot of journals, blank, or as so-and-so smart person says, blank, and I do this sometimes, it's never good. I had a friend once get really mad at me for that, and a friend, a very good friend who I love very much, probably never watched this stream, but he's one of my best friends in the world. He said that sometimes arguing or debating with me feels like arguing with a bunch of random articles that may or may not exist, <laughs> because he said I had this tendency to like be like, well, I read in this thing that it says that or whatever. And not that it's bad to read things, but then it's like, if all you're doing is pointing at references, you're not really engaging in a conversation. And he got really mad at me once, but we're still friends. I don't know what the point of that story is. I don't know, friendship is rare. Once we establish aim, the world arrays itself around us into something like pathways and tools and obstacles. That's associated, that concept I derived in part from J.J. Gibson's conceptualization of perception. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Affordances. Right. Okay. right, exactly. Okay, so and, and so, what do you think of Gibson's ideas? I think most of them are, are excellent. I've no been writing about affordances for some time, and uh, 
what I think Gibson was weak on is he didn't talk about how affordances are actually tracked in the brain. He 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 uh, was he sort of threw up his threw up his hands about that and and said uh, the information is in the light. Well, yeah, but how does the information in the light get into our heads and do? All right, so I think let's see. We have some stuff queued up. Um, I have not seen this yet. I know Henry is stoked on it. This Eddie Brubaker Apple headset video. Maybe we'll pivot to that. I think, and if anyone wants to keep watching the Peterson and um, Dennett thing, I'll get the link in the that, chat. Yeah, I think that you totally should. Um, but I don't know if that's what we want to keep doing. Uh, I'm going to change the title of the stream as we watch a different video, guys. It's just a test. I'm testing some stuff. Uh, would you say the videos about how Apple headsets are dystopian? Okay. Okay, I'm just changing some friggin' some friggin' hashtags just to see what will happen if I do it. Um, okay, so let's and thanks for hanging out. Let us do that. I really appreciate it. Because um, it was interesting to get into that. And I do think, you know, later someday, I don't know about this, guys. Some some days I think like it would be fun to do really long streams where I could just go through a full video like that. Someday, guys, someday we're talking about I like to let you guys inside, you know, the corporate world. This is this is too much information for you all. But as you probably know, I've talked about this. Our office where we do this is pretty far from my house. It takes me like an hour to get here, hour and a half to get back. And it's a lot of time. That's time that I could be, I don't know, sleeping, consuming content, um, hanging out with my daughter, practicing guitar, napping, listening to golf podcast, making tacos, all the things that I love to do. Um, also, everyone should have a taco night, by the way. So there you go. Oh, Sean, do you got to so Sean's going to the sphere next weekend. Please take notes, Sean, because I'm going to the sphere uh, next month and I'm going to need all your tips. Never been to Vegas before, guys, too. So if anyone has Vegas tips, uh, wisecracklive666 at gmail.com. I would love to hear any Vegas tips people have. Henry, have you been to Vegas before? Last time I was in Vegas, I was under 21, but I did spend all night at the arcade under the MGM Grand, which was like a 24-hour thing with like unlimited credits and stuff. That was fun. Yeah. Um, oh, man. So let's see. I just got an email that I just saw about someone guesting on our show. Um, oh? Hold on one second. Just one second, guys. Um, sorry, so someone who's um, our friends over at Yellow Dot Media um, are working with this group called Shut the Fossils Up, and they're doing a media contest where people can make stuff about climate change and other things and win a bunch of money. And I invited them on to talk about it and tell you how you guys could win money because, like, fucking money is cool. So uh, he, he might pop on in a bit. So we'll see. I'll, I'll let you know, Henry, if it seems like that's going to happen. But I love okay. Vegas. Stuff. What is your what is your Vegas story, Henry? You started talking and then I got distracted. Oh, it was uh, like I said, it was a while back. It was before I was 21. So I can do a lot. But oh, what? Oh, oh. I paused. I paused. Oh, I just spent most of the time in an arcade overnight because, uh, yeah, I didn't have much else I could do at that age. All right, cool. Um, well, it's good to know. I'm I'm afraid to go um, to Vegas. Uh, I don't like gambling. Everything seems really expensive. All that sort of stuff. What's What's the Omega Mart experience? I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. Okay, is that let's watch. Meow Wolf. Videos. They're talking about it's you know like a walkable art installation that's like oh. supposed to be a satirical supermarket. I think. Oh, that sounds. Oh, okay, okay, that sounds kind of fun. Um, well, yeah, well, let's watch a little bit of this. I'm sure some of you have seen it before, but I haven't. And I know I've only watched a couple Eddie Burback videos, but his mustache rips. Hi, I'm a 3D avatar representing the human Eddie Burback. 
Today That's scary. I can talk to you thanks to the powerful magic of Apple's new product. The it's Apple scary. Vision Pro. Apple Vision Pro headset. People are talking about it. It is called Apple Vision Pro. It involves a term you may not be familiar with, spatial computing. It's $3,500. Do you think this is something that the average person will be able to afford? I don't know. So, wh what, why do you need this? <laughs> In February of 2024, Apple released their newest product. Wait, in the chat, there's been time. Let us know who's used this. I'm sure someone has to have used one or, or seen a, had a friend that had one or something like that. I assume you haven't, Henry, just because I feel like you would have mentioned it. No, I have not. I've used the Oculus Quest and a few other VR headsets. Uh, I like the PSVR, um, but yeah, I haven't found any reason like to buy one for my own personal use. It's all been like yeah. just like checking out of friends. Um, Excellus in the chat did some research for us. We appreciate it. It says, Birch Gold was founded in Los Angeles in 2003 by Iraqi-born Laith Paul Al-Saraf. The company's name is an obvious nod to the John Birch Society. Wow! That sounds... An obvious nod. Yeah. Trees Please says, yo, this video's lit. Gets in our corporations are alienating us from our environment. I mean, that's what's... Yeah, the alienation, guys. The problem is going deep. The problem is going deep. Let's let's watch a little bit of this. The Apple Vision Pro to the public. The Pro is a headset that recreates your surroundings with its cameras, allowing you to use its computing power while seeing the world in front of you. While connecting to your Apple phone and computer, it's being pitched as the next step in our ever-evolving connection with technology. The era of spatial computing is here. But some see its $3,500 price tag, bulky ski goggle appearance, and overall pitch as something to be disregarded and laughed at. It's also being criticized as yet another way to disconnect people from reality. We, this is not about isolation. This is about connection. So are we seeing an early version of an advancement like the smartphone? Or is this just another expensive toy for rich tech bros? Back in February, I decided to find out for myself. Yeah, I mean, it is like the alienation we experience via technology is just growing more and more and more immersive. And sometimes I think about, you know, let me go into dad mode for a second. I worry about like my, my kid, kids in general, the future. Like, is it a future where all the kids just sit around with their little their little things on, you know, watching their little stuff, um, not in touch with reality? And in a sense, I'm going to get a little bit stoner logic here. So work with me, but note that I'm saying hashtag stoner logic. I'm not stoned right now, but um, this is a stonery thought. But doesn't it just coincidentally work out that at the same time that ecosystems are collapsing and temperatures are rising and air quality is going down and weather events are happening and, and poverty is increasing and we, we all those things are more apparent, at the same time those things are happening in our physical and natural reality, there's a bigger push from big companies for us to be abstracted from that, not paying attention. Don't look at the thing that's happening outside. Stare at the screen so we can capture data from your ocular movements. I'm just saying those two things are lining up. I'm just saying. That's all. I, I'm allowed to be a little conspiratorial every now and then because conspiracy theories play well on the internet. So, yeah, that's what I'm doing. But let's, oh yeah, he'll get to that concern. Great. Um, stoner logic is over for now. Here we go. Yeah, Ready Player One, of course. Buying the Vision Pros was a bit harder of a process than I initially thought it would be. Instead of just adding to my cart, filling out my card info, and watching $3,500 vanish into thin air, Apple first asked me to scan my head with my uh, phone. Uh. To scan my face, oop, there's a smudge on my screen, hold on. To scan my face, I had to go through a process identical to iPhone's Face ID feature. Not only did I have the pleasure of giving a trillion dollar company the amount of money equivalent to a used 2012 Nissan Altima, nice. but I also got to give them a detailed scan of my skull. My next roadblock was that apparently you- Wait, speaking of used Altimas, I gotta share this, guys. Someone hit my car this weekend. I was parked on the street in front of my house, and two cars, like, hit my neighbor's car and my car, and it jammed my neighbor's car into mine. And then I was like, okay, this isn't so bad. Like, insurance, right? I'm going to sound really dumb in a second, so get ready to judge me. So then I, like, call insurance, and I'm like, oh, let's get a quote. They'll just, like, fix this thing. And insurance was like, yeah, dog, you got to pay at least $1,000 out of pocket. And I was like, what? $1,000 is a lot of money. Because, like, what's the point of anything? 
Um, and now I don't know like when or if I'm going to get it fixed when my car is leased. So I have to get it fixed at some point. And I went to the place insurance told me to go to. And the guy there was like, and I, I like when the guys do this. The guy at the auto body shop that insurance made me go to was kind of like, low key, you're going to get fucked here. Go see my boy three blocks away. Tell him I sent you yada yada, which felt like a little bit sketchy, but also I kind of appreciated it. So now I'm going to go and find some like chill old Armenian dude who will hopefully do it for cheap. That wasn't a weird comment on Armenians. It's just where I live. All the auto bodies near me, all the auto body shops are run by Armenian bros. So, you know, if anyone has any like code words to get an old Armenian bro to give you a deal, let me know. But I hate cars and I wish we had public transportation. And now I can't buy like cool music gear because I got to fix my car. You can't wear gloves with the Vision Pros. This is odd to me because every VR headset that I've ever worn lets you do that. But hey, for the- It's also weird that you can't wear glasses because no offense, a lot of people that seem like they'd be into this are glasses wearers. The price of a used 2006 Mitsubishi Lancer, I why would I doing. expect some sort of convenience? Now I've been wearing glasses since I was two years old. My eyesight from birth was described as near and farsighted with a cross eye or fucked as they say in the medical community. Now, lucky for me, I had an awesome ophthalmologist that corrected a lot of my vision and my eyes from crossing during my childhood, Shots but I still need glasses to see. So to see out of my vision pros, I need to spend another $149 Whoa. to upload my prescription and get optical inserts that attach to the screen. So after I took a photo of my prescription info and uploaded it, I decided to skip Apple Care because I didn't want to spend an extra $500. So with just the Apple Vision Pros and the optical inserts in my cart, it came out to a total of just. I guess that makes me feel better about fixing my car. But then I, but then he spent this money to make a video that probably made money. Four thousand dollars. That was fine by me. I'm kind of curious in the chat. If you had four thousand dollars, what would you what would you do? Four thousand dollars. You could do any, but it can't be like pay my rent or get health insurance, because that's no fun. So I picked it up with zero hesitation. It's sponsor money. It's not, it's not my money. The next day yeah. I walked over See, to the Apple go. store. Oh, someone said, Michael, where can I find your, I, I play in a cover band called Bored Betty. We have a YouTube page. If you look up Bored Betty on YouTube, you'll find it. Oh, I know where this is. Pick up my luxury goggles. Because the Vision Pros were all over the internet that week, I decided to bring my backpack with me to conceal the box on my walk home. Unfortunately, the Apple employee I talked to informed me that it would be too big for my backpack. When I told him I was walking home and asked if there was a nondescript bag available, he said, I mean, it doesn't say Vision Pros on it. And then I was handed this bag complete with two uh -huh. apple logos and the vision pros box clearly visible like if you are gonna rob someone now obviously the bag is not designed for me someone who's embarrassed to have made such a gross purchase for a product that i don't need it's made to be a statement look at this shiny headset i bought i'm better than you but when i see it it just shouts rob me steal from me please yes. not only is this expensive but i deserve it but fortunately for me, and unfortunately for the state of society, the shithead YouTuber didn't get robbed of his $4,000 glasses on the walk home. And my brother Tony and I got back to my apartment to break these goggles out of the box. I popped the headset on and I gotta say, I've never looked cooler in my entire life. These goggles make me look like I'm somehow 4 and 40 at the same damn time. What, what would one do with those goggles? I'm curious. You know, no, you can't pay off debt. It has to be something fun. It has to be something fun, okay? Whoa, Sean wants to do a foodie trip to the Basque region of Spain. Um, that would be awesome. I've been to San Sebastian once and ate food, and it was awesome. It was awesome. No, you can't save, guys. You have to do something fun. You have to. You have to. Synths, synths are awesome. Yeah, spend it, spend it in a fun way. I just like, yeah, so extraneous says it. I'm not trying to be silly, guys, but like, of course, it would be porn. Like, everything. Yeah, Pino. I just, everything becomes about porn on the internet. That's just like, I don't want to be too explicit here, but that's just like a sad vision. Just thousands of people wearing their vision pros, 
just just fapping themselves dry. That just sounds bad. Um, what would we do? Continue to ignore a hundred plus text messages? Yeah, and I feel like you know then it would be weird because you're in like the Vision Pro world and you're going to Fap City, and then you're getting like Slack messages from your boss. And you're like, oh, that does not sound fun at all. I uh, get a little secret. I'm neither. I'm 27. After the initial setup, it was time for my second face scan of the process. To set up your persona, you'll remove Apple Vision Pro to capture your appearance. Uh. Now, slowly turn your head to the left. Brighten the lighting on your face to continue. Adjust your head by tilting it slightly down. Whoa. Adjust your head by <laughs> then make a big smile with your teeth showing. Now raise your eyebrows. Adjust your head. This one is to let the pros use measurements of my face to recreate a highly detailed, lifelike avatar of myself so I can still FaceTime friends and family while wearing the headset. Whoa, I didn't get that that's what they're using it for. That is that is very weird, guys. That is very weird. This is like just turning me into more and more of a of a Luddite. Just of a of a Luddite for sure. Whoa, mortgage payment. Two, sorry, people talking about mortgage payments in this situation. 4K is a mortgage payment. I mean, like that would be a mortgage payment if you were in Los Angeles, California, for sure. So um probably be more than that i think i'm gonna move soon i'll tell you guys more about it because if if i move I'll, I'll be streaming from the new place on mondays it's hard though i have a rent control apartment so to move we have to leave the rent control apartment but the current rent control apartment just isn't a good place with the kid and stuff you know but let's let's do this <laughs> that's not cool hi that's not cool hey tony, hey, tony. Jesus Christ. Remember, Remember me, me from, from the womb? womb? <laughs> <That's> so bad. <laughs> oh, I can see your eyes. That's so weird. Wait, so it's fake eyes on the outside of the thing? Do I look good? After seeing the avatar no. myself, I couldn't believe how lifelike it looked. It was like I was staring in a mirror. I felt like I was truly seeing myself for the very first time. Hi, Eddie. Hi, Eddie. Hi, Eddie. Hi, After Tony left, I used the headset on my own to explore Apple's environments. Okay, not just porn though, you could also do drugs and use those. Drugs and porn seem to be the Here two I most am on the moon. Things. And I even got to meet a dinosaur. What if you did a bunch of drugs and then you went to Dinosaur Island and you forgot you forgot that you had goggles on so you couldn't get them off and you couldn't get away from the dinosaurs? Someone's going to do Hi. that. That's, that's, oh, that's scary. After my first few hours with the headset, I just had one thought. And there's actually not a lot to do with this thing, huh? It's kind of way over rent money for the month, and uh, I just looked at the fucking moon for a second. So I started to try and brainstorm how I could use the headset as a utility. During my first day of use, I noticed that the second I put the headset on, I was instantly dooming myself to a day of hat hair, or uh, goggle hair, I guess. My hair. Wouldn't you just feel depressed as well? Because getting natural light is like good for us. It was getting pretty long anyways, so I asked my friend Sam to come cut it that night. This was my chance to use the headset as a tool for style for the very first time. So with the internet quite literally at the ends of my fingertips, I began deep research into what the coolest men's haircut is right now. Maybe I buzz the whole thing. I never researched that, sadly. Oh my gosh, should I get bangs? No, it's too much of a commitment. Here's what your haircut says about you. If you're bald, you don't care what anybody thinks. Maybe a mullet? I don't really think I'm a mullet guy, but everyone's getting a fucking mullet lately. The modern mullet, out. The undercut, out. The broccoli head ass, out. But with that little it is. Really this is really overwhelming. I'm finding, I'm finding like just watching this on a screen really overwhelming. Um, we'll keep going.
But that's how I feel. You prefer to keep your like Oh man, that's baby. I saw a ton of great options, but I was completely overwhelmed by choice. Yeah, I got a haircut. Okay, so what do you want? Let's see. 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 Let's do you, do you want it like a lot shorter or like a little bit shorter? Probably one of the most versatile face shapes that there is. Mostly because the oval face shape is the perfect I'm, balance. Is anyone else freaking out just watching this? Uh, you, whatever, whatever uh, sounds good. Okay. Day two with the headset, I decided to try out some other features of the goggles. But real quick, a word from the sponsor of this video. I got stuck in a mouse trap. Don't freaking ask. This video is sponsored uh. by Display. Display I have to look at what other sponsors people as do. a refreshing alternative to paper or version of it was. The possibilities oh. of AR games content. But hey, I went, you know, I the went too far past the two or more displays. They're also offering their new product, Textra. It means textures with 3D contours. This type of product is not discounted, but check it out if you like it. Okay, back to the video. I went to the App Store and was surprised with how empty it felt. Compared to the app store on my phone, there was just a lot less content. But hey, you know, the tech is new. I'm sure Apple made some really cool games to showcase the headset. And one of the first games displayed by Apple was a familiar one, Jetpack Joyride. I used to play the original iPhone app back in high school and was excited to see what the Vision Pro version of it was. The possibilities of AR gaming are something that I dreamed of when I was a kid. I was finally ready to experience the next generation of gaming. So I booted it up suck. and the game instantly went completely into a VR mode. So you just, it's the same thing, but you're... Is this just the fucking iPad app? <laughs> this My was God. just the iPad app with a VR room around. But isn't that like, okay. I'm sure you guys know this in the video. We're not going to watch the whole thing. But this just seems so indicative as well of the way in which we are sold more and more expensive like platforms pieces of hardware things of that nature but the products themselves increasingly suck ass like e even and this isn't a one-for-one -one example but like streaming services cost more and, and high-speed internet costs more and nice tvs and everything costs more and you got your sound system and stuff like that but then the shows look like shit, right um yeah it feels like this is it just feels like this is where we're going like you get the whole kit and caboodle and you have shitty games and the same shitty youtube videos except you you watch them on the new expensive thing yeah it's not fun someone's prince nutella said i'm not ready for the future i don't know guys i think i i think i might not be ready for the future uh, again, guys, thanks for hanging out. It's Wisecrack Live. Got a little bit of the show left today. Yeah, and shitification, says Beatmaster. Um, you know, we're hanging out. We got some videos coming out. We have a video coming out on, what day is it? On Friday. I keep forgetting what this one is on. Oh! Friday, we have a video coming out on, like, the service industry and jobs. No, that's not what's coming out on Friday. Guys, I can't remember what our next video is. This is really breaking my brain. I gotta look it up so I can tell you what it is. Yeah, it's because I just want you to know. So I'm a little lost on it too. Yeah, I want you to know what it is. It's not service. Oh, how finance destroyed culture. That's the next video. So it's looking at the finance industry uh, and how private equity. This is this relates to what we're talking about. How everything's shitty now, right? Because private equity has taken over the entertainment industry in a variety of ways. They're they're controlling our media and they're making it very bad and they're making decisions not on the basis of what media is good, what's gonna make them money and stuff. Yeah, Lonkin, we got you on Monday. So there you go. Um, let's watch a little bit more of this. Yeah, as always, you know, I guess the reason why I don't like to watch the full video is it creates motivation for you guys to watch a little bit at the end. Um, Henry, how big of a pain in the ass will it be to like switch to Zoom to get this guy on at the end? Not the hardest. We'll just want to go to pre-roll for a moment to switch from Discord to Zoom. But um, once it's up, uh, I'll be right back on. All right, I'm gonna send that guy the thing, and I'll say that we'll we'll pop over at 11:50. And you guys have to stick around for that. If everyone leaves, 
I'm going to go to your house and tell your mom Special that you're Special surprise guest. I'm going to say, if you leave, I'm going to go to your mom's house. And I'm going to say, you won't believe what your child did. You won't believe it. Let's see. All right. Pop in. Thanks for letting me do this, guys. Pop in here at 11.50. And I'll have you talk about the contest and share more about your organization's work. Okay. I think it's a fun thing. I'm doing this because I think you guys will actually like it because I care about you. I, and I'm in love with all of you. But hey, you know, that's not their only game they have to offer. They had a Dogs board game shit. app where I got to play some Battleship, and I misunderstood that red didn't mean bad. It meant hit. So oh, I thought so I was boring. getting hit after hit after hit when I was getting miss after miss after miss. It was very embarrassing when I realized. But then I decided to give it a go with someone online. Would I get to see their avatar or would I get to That's speak creepy. to them? How does that work with That's the Vision creepy. Pro? We will never find out because there were not enough people online to match with somebody. This product is simply not popular enough to match make with someone online. Oh, also quick side note, the Vision Pro camera does this weird flickering thing with a lot of screens when it gets dark. So I had to turn off my lamp just so it didn't annoy me in the peripherals by flashing me every couple of seconds and the last game i wanted to try was something called synth riders now synth riders cool. is a clone of beat saber in vr and yes you know beat saber is a rhythm game that's inspired by guitar hero which inspired rock band but synth riders is like a full-blown clone of beat saber but okay i'll admit it's a little fun i'm actually not missing any notes I'm kind of the first thing they showed that looks cool game. Oh my god, it's like I'm the ninja of synth riders. Wow, he's really doing it. He's really doing it. I, I hope this is the rest of the video. That would be awesome. If he just made this thought. No, he didn't. It's fading out. It's At fading out. At the end out. of day two. Even as someone who was skeptical about the headset, I couldn't help but feel very underwhelmed by it. In general, I was just kind of bored. And yes, I did have a little bit of fun. But after just two days of using the headset, I found that I had no desire to put it on. This piece of technology that had cost me more than a used Suzuki XL7EX sat unused. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's... To be on the first wave of any technology, always shitty. Um, I mean, someone, wait, did you watch the whole video? What are, what are the, what are the conclusions he gets to? Because we're not going to get to the end of this. For someone who watched yeah, it, there's, it, there's, it, there's, us. there's more of the video. One of the things he starts doing is trying to force reasons for it. And there's a really interesting part where he's having a conversation with a friend rambling about sports. And he's trying to keep up by Googling sports. Um, and I think that just Ooh. leans into sort of uh, what we're already doing with our phones and kind of like, I don't know, it raises questions about like, well, what, what are we communicating? What's the point of having a conversation with the person if we're going to just be kind of, you know, Googling facts on the fly and trying to like come up with like the right answers to the puzzle? Yeah. Um, oh, someone brought up renting them. But yeah, I mean, just again, I think, I think we live in this era. And I guess this is back to maybe hashtag stoner logic. We've really digressed from talking about Daniel Daniel Dennett and Jordan Peterson. Um, but I but I I can't help but wonder, in my best Sex in the City impersonation, how much of all of this stuff. Or no, let me phrase this differently. A thing I like to do sometimes. This is definitely stoner logic, and I've talked about this before on stream. I like to imagine um, what would it be like. <laughs> To be an alien, and I and I and I'm an alien that understands, you know, human language. I have I, my perception matches up with our reality, and I come to this world and I look at it, and I'm just like, what are people doing? And if I I walk around and everyone's just like hunched over and they're just doing this all day, and then I go to like a coffee shop to get this this beverage called coffee, and everyone's either doing that or they're doing like that, and and then people have the headsets on and they're just like doing they're doing that. I, I don't know. I, I think we're so in it. You know, we're like we're like the fish in the ocean who someone tells us about water. And we're like, what the fuck are you talking about? What the fuck is water? But I know, honey, man, it wasn't a good 
Sex and the City thing. Let me see. I guess my Sex and the City impression would be like, as I finished the video on the the Apple Pro headset, I started to wonder, are all men just animals inside of a VR headset that want to fuck me? I don't know. That was bad. I'm not doing my best job. But, oh, Ann Porkin says, it's, we get used to wearing it, and it's scary how easily we can accept a bunch of screens and baloney all over our eyes. Yeah, but I guess that's what I'm saying. Like, we, we're the fish in the water, but water is just like an element made, I guess it's not an element. What is water? Fuck. Hashtag stoner thoughts. But the water that we swim in is just distractive technologies owned by really wealthy companies that we're all increasingly addicted to. You know, a thing that I've realized, I mean, we'll do parent corner for a second. Maybe some other parents are in here or have seen this. It's pretty fucked up how sometimes you're like with your child. Like my daughter's like playing on the floor and it's like, this is a human, you know, I've created, we like her, she's cool. But then I like pick up my phone and open the Reddit app to see an insane story about how in some country people are digging up dead bodies to get high off the fumes. That's a real thing. Um, as my daughter is like exploring consciousness and learning how to do stuff, it's like, what are we doing? Yeah, someone says he says on a YouTube live stream. That's what I'm saying, guys. We're in the fish. We're in the waters or we're the fish in the water. I totally get it. I mean, I get that it's, you know, I'm saying this on a stream i will say at least on the stream there's some level of humanity in that like we're here together at the same time for those of you who are watching this after the fact you know we're there with you spiritually we wish we we could hang out with you but for those in the chat we're here someone said michael the turkey philosopher yeah i think it's just that i'm hungry too guys i i have a trying to have a no eating on stream rule but there's just a snack to my left just a really huge want. hot bar right off to the side of camera. Just a just a huge, huge thing. Okay, cool. So our man, Mark, from Shut the Fossils Up, is going to come in and talk to us in a second, which I think will be cool, guys. I think we will. I think you will enjoy it. Um, so finish. The, yeah, we'll hop over to the Zoom. I'll, I'll log in. How, how does how, how's, how should it work, Henry? What should the move be? I'm going to put us back to the pre-roll so chat can hang out and have some fun and refresh their drink while we get set up. Yeah. And we'll be no back one in leave. about 40 seconds. If no anything, one leave. get more people here. But here we go.
All right, awesome. Um, Mark, thank you so much for being here. I'm Michael. It's nice to meet you. Um, Good to meet you. Yeah. So, Mark, you're with Shut the Fossils Up. Um, I learned recently via our friend Elijah over at Yellow Dot about, I guess, what would you call it, like a content competition that you're currently hosting? Yeah. Um, it's social media content competition. So, um, uh, Yellow Dot and Shut the Fossils Up are partnering on this uh, national um competition to uh, to do what the name of the of shut the fossils up is about i think probably w w no matter where you live in in the united states you see all these ads and other kinds of propaganda from the fossil fuel industry um sometimes they identify themselves who they are sometimes it's through some kind of a front front group that sounds good like here in, I'm in New York state mm -hmm. in New York. There's a group called New Yorkers for affordable energy. Sounds oh, good. Yep, right? yep, yep. Um, but basically what they're pushing out is a lot of disinformation. So we're, we're uh, calling on content creators to create videos, memes, anything that they, you know, that's their sweet spot to kind of call out what the industry is doing, call out the disinformation, the talking points, they're using the same talking points all over the country. Um, mm -hmm. So we want to call attention to it. And we want to kind of, once people generate this content, um, we want to put it to use by local groups all around the country who are trying to fight back against the industry's um, disinformation. Oh, that's awesome. Well, yeah. And I know a lot of our audience are like content creators and make stuff. So I, We'll, I've asked you a couple of questions, but I encourage everyone watching. We'll post a link um, to this. Um, it, it is when is the deadline currently? So currently, it's this Friday. All right, cool. Um, that's still till time for for some great content creators to make stuff. Um, yeah. Can I ask you a little bit then about? And I'm just curious about this because I'm learning about you all in the context of learning about this contest. Um, how long have have you all existed uh, as, as Shut the Fossils Up? Set the fossils up relatively recent. We kind mm -hmm. of piloted it last spring. Oh, cool. Uh, during the New York State legislative session and did some experiments. Uh, but then we kind of ramped it up in the fall when we started working with with uh, Yellow Dot. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. And how have you found, I don't know, in your experience, because I know that that for the sort of work you're doing, I imagine a big part of it is like one, like you said, pointing out the way in which a lot of ads and organizations that seem benign are doing ideological work for, for fossil fuel companies. Um, but how have you found using media and using content, using things like that? Um, how, how effective are you finding this as tools to kind of wake people up to what's going on, both in terms of the climate crisis in general, and then the sort of uh, media manipulation around it? It's a great question. Um... How much time do you have? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. The floor <laughs> right, is yours, so Mark. I'll give you. I'll give you. Try and give you the the uh, compact version. So my background, before I got involved as full time climate organizer and activist, I spent about forty years in the independent documentary world. Oh, awesome! Um, I started a series on public television called POV, which yeah. is a showcase for independent documentaries. It's been on for thirty six years now. Um, so my I, my DNA, like where my origin story, is about using film and other media to um, tell stories about movement organizing, to tell stories about our communities, um, both as a way to make people more aware, but also as organizing tools, mm -hmm. like but to talk about what what kind of issues are out there, what people are facing, what organizations are working on. Um, and you can probably, you know, think of many, many examples of great documentaries in the past 30, 40 years that have really done that. So that's the background that I come out of. Mm -hmm. um, and I put most of that on the back burner when I started doing climate organizing about 10, 11 years ago mm -hmm. um, and wasn't doing a lot of media based work. But I realized so we I'm part of a coalition in New York State called New York Renews. That's a statewide coalition of almost 400 organizations. Um, the coalition wrote and passed a major climate bill in New York State in 2019. 
um, considered really the most ambitious climate legislation in the country and a model for some of the things that um, the Biden administration has done over the last couple of years. The, the fossil fuel industry was a little bit asleep at the wheel when that bill passed. They didn't expect it to pass, and I won't go into the details about why, but what we've seen in the last three and a half, four years is that they have really piled on doing everything they can to um, delay action, to mm -hmm. delay implementing this, this very ambitious law. And it, so when there's enabling legislation and legislature, they're doing all these ads, putting out scare stories, um, telling people it's not going to be reliable. It's going to cost you tens of thousands yeah. of dollars out of your pocket. So I realized, OK, I've got this media background. I need to kind of bring that back into the toolbox of what I'm working on. And um, but do it in the context of what's happening in 2023, 2024, where the main battleground is social media. Mm -hmm. It's no longer, I mean, there's still great feature length documentaries being made um, and they're streaming now and they're available to people in their living rooms. But what most people are looking at on a daily basis are social media, right? TikTok, YouTube, uh, Twitter, I will not call it X. Um, <laughs> That's, uh, I think I really appreciate that. That is our rule here. We, we do not call it that. So. I, I appreciate yeah. that we're playing by house rules. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I appreciate that that's your house rules. So um, <laughs> when we when we connected with Yellow Dot last fall, mm -hmm. the whole idea was like, let's produce stuff that we can push out quickly, that can be respond, like respond to what the industry is doing initially. The idea was to do it in New York State as a kind of a trial of like, how can we push back at the industry and do it in a way that's mocking them because mm -hmm. like this, there's lots of serious stuff out there. There's lots of doom and gloom, but I think laughter is a lifeline. Um, I need to get a daily dose of big belly laughs. Yeah. Um, Cause that releases the tension for me, but also I think it breaks through the noise. Right. So yeah. if you, if you can produce stuff that's really funny and that really calls out the industry in a way that, Kind of takes away their power. Mm -hmm. So we we and I don't want to go into a huge amount of detail, but we did a whole slew of videos that we released in February with Yellow Dot that took on one of the people who's leading the disinformation campaign in New York State. Um, Fifteen videos that we released over the course of a week and got a huge response, like over awesome. one hundred fifty thousand views, and it's really really getting a lot of traction. So. Yeah. Then we said, okay, the, but we see that the industry is using the same playbook they're using in New York. They're using it all over the country. So let's nationalize this and let's go out and meet the industry where they're, you know, where they're doing their stuff, particularly in states where there is actually a movement that's moving climate action and climate solutions forward. So I'd like, yeah. that's the long answer to your short question. No, I liked it though. I like that very much. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, and I definitely relate to what you're saying in terms of using humor to talk about big ideas. Um, you know, we're primarily a, a YouTube channel that makes longer video essays, analyzing a lot of things that aren't fun about our world and trying to use humor and research to get to the bottom of them in a way that isn't off-putting. Um, but I, I like what you're saying as well, because I think with a lot of the disinformation that's coming from organizations backed by these companies, like in general, I feel like people that are more on the side of fighting the climate crisis are always going to have less money um, right. than those folks. But I think I, I like that you're locating that what, you know, your your side does have is access to more ideally like creativity and people that can make compelling things and people that have senses of humor and people that have empathy. Um, so it's very cool to see that you are challenging, that you're channeling that in a way uh, that can allow people to do something also seems cool because I know for a lot of folks, and this is something, um, you know, to, to spoil it for our audience that's watching this, I'm working on a, a video that we're going to make alongside Yellow Dot right now. And one of the goals for that longer video we're making is getting out the question of what, what can we actually do as individuals and what is our responsibility and complicity, uh, you know, for the climate crisis as individuals 
And this seems like a great way for people who are good at making stuff to, to do something. So I think it's cool that you guys are offering that opportunity um, to do so. Yeah. And did we say there's prize money? Oh, who cares about that? But yes, there's, um, <laughs> I'm looking at it right now. Well, what do we got? First place, 5,000 runners up. A couple of people are getting 2,500. Then there, right. I like that you have a People's Choice Award too. If we get a critical mass of submissions that, you know, that meet the criteria, mm -hmm. uh, then we're going to do, you know, a selection yellow dot and we will do a selection. But we also want to put things out there and see what the general public responds to. That's really cool. I'm uh, right now I'm dropping for anyone in the chat. We've already linked to the main page. I'm going to link to the submission page. So everyone has access to that as well. Um, and, you know, just for people watching this, I like that you describe what you want as original videos, memes, GIFs, or whatever else you can think of. I like the idea that you're leaving um, the canvas pretty open for people to be creative in whichever way they see fit. Um, to challenge fossil fuel industry gaslighting and disinformation. So, um, and I also like that you're, you want material that's original, funny, creative, can help mobilize people. So, um, and there's some examples I know you have there. So I do encourage all our friends who are watching this um, to go take a look. You still have a couple days to get something made. Um, if you know people who make great content and funny content that you like, I would send this their way, a really cool opportunity to do something that feels morally virtuous and and you could also make some some money off of it um when, when do you think then mark uh for those who plan to submit or for those who just want to see the submissions uh, when do you think people uh, will, will be able to see some of this stuff uh after it's submitted and you guys have a chance to look at it uh, a couple of weeks we're, we're awesome. going to try and turn it around as quickly as possible and the, the actual dates are on the um the page that you're linking to oh, cool, that cool, you're cool. showing people yeah. So yeah, it's got a whole, you know, like time frame and how it works. And I should just mention this is, it says this on the submission page, but it's important to know the prize money is allows us to license what what people are creating mm -hmm. and to be able to then sub license it to activist groups around the country. Awesome. To be able to adapt it for their own use. So really this is partly to use these media as organizing tools. Right. This is you said earlier, fossil fuel industry has a lot of money to spend. And maybe you've heard the expression, the best answer to organized money is organized people. Yeah. So we want to use these videos both to put a spotlight on what the industry is doing, the disinformation, but also to organize people to fight back against it. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and that's, yeah, very cool to know that people participating in this could make something that they feel good about and know that that thing is going to have a positive uh, and hopefully sort of motivating effect in a right. very big fight. So uh, again, I encourage everyone to sign up for that. Um, and Mark, I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to follow you up with your email. I'd love to have you on again another time to talk a little bit more about this and learn more about what you guys are doing, because it all sounds really interesting. And I'm just starting to uh, learn about STFU you know, via talking to you. So if you ever have time, right. we'd, we'd love to have a longer I love, conversation I love on this. To do it. I, I, I didn't know about your show before, but um, yeah. I really appreciate what you're doing. I want to know more about what you're up to. Yeah. And I'd love to be on again whenever it's a good time for you. Yeah. And I already, you know, I, I tease this to our audience where we're hopefully going to be making some more stuff kind of like you guys alongside yellow dot soon. So maybe we can find some good excuses to uh, work together and, and talk about some have, of this stuff more. Have fun. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming uh, coming by so last minute. I really appreciate you just popping on. And again, everyone, um, STFU, shut the fossils up. Uh, it has a Dirty Disinfo Smackdown video and meme contest. We have links in our chat. We'll put a link in the description as well. You got a couple days to jump in. So please consider doing that. And Mark, thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, really appreciate thank it. You. Good to meet you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Have a good Take one. Take good care. Yeah. So Great. So everyone in the chat, what a what a cool guy. Very nice to get to, to meet a new person. Um, so for those of you that make stuff, consider making stuff for this contest. I think that sounds that sounds fun. Henry, you should make something. I think I think you should do it. I think I mean who do we know? We got a lot of people in our community that make stuff. So I, I encourage y'all to do it. And we have some fun stuff coming up with with the yellow dot crew. So I'm gonna be excited about that. Uh, we went a little bit over. I appreciate everyone for hanging out.
As always, like the stream if you haven't, comment on it after the fact, sign up for Patreon, go to Henry's house and give him a casserole, all the things that you know we got to oh, do. that sounds so lovely. Henry needs a casserole, guys. Hashtag get Henry a casserole. Um, and let us know what you thought of today's show. As always, if there's stuff you want us to talk about, hit us up on Twitter. Uh, jump in our Discord, which you can join if you do the stuff. Um, and then uh, we have an email, wisecracklive666 at gmail.com. Hit us up there. Um, and I'm going to tease something, guys. I think in two weeks, I'll talk to Henry about this. We might do another live from the streets of a major American city that is not Los Angeles stream. Ooh. We might, we might, we might, we might have to do it. And we might have to do it to him. So everyone get ready for that. And Ann Borgans, bye forever. See you soon. That's maybe my favorite goodbye we've ever had. Um, but yeah, it's been Wisecrack Live for April 10th. Love you guys. See you soon. Have a great week. Have a great weekend, y'all. See you Monday.